this thing. Hebrews 11, 29. This is what God says. Sorry, I've got the wrong verse. Hebrews 21. Okay. First mistake, 21. Hebrews 11, 21. Faith, Jacob, when he was dying, left both the sons of Joseph and worshipped, leaning upon the top of his staff. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we can be in your word. Lord, thank you for giving us life. We praise you for your goodness to us. Lord, we're thankful for your faithfulness in our lives. Lord, be, we would have no faith at all if it wouldn't be for your faithfulness in our lives. Lord, I'm also thankful that you don't look at all the momentary mistakes in our lives and wrong choices that we make. And Lord, even though they seem many at times, that you are forgiving, that you are loving, and that you always bring your prom promises to pass in our lives. Lord, I pray today that you would open your word to our hearts. Lord, many of us struggle in many things. Lord, some life is a continual struggle. I pray for them today, Lord, that they would turn to you and lean upon you and give their heart completely to you in such a way, Lord, uh, that you would honor that and that you would work in their lives. I pray, Lord, if there be one here that doesn't know Christ, that you would save them today, save them from their sin, save them from that which will destroy them and, and destroy their lives, but worst of all, will separate them from eternity with you. Lord, I just pray that you would work. Open our eyes, we now ask in Jesus' name, amen. The Bible says in Job 5, 7, yet man is born unto trouble as the sparks fly up. Do you know anyone who was born for trouble? I know next week's Mother's Day, but I'm sure many mothers are now looking for their sons. <laughs> you know, trouble uh, seems to be, trouble, the word trouble and them seem to be synonymous Maybe you should have named them Aiken, which means trouble, right? They always are bucking and resisting. There's always this wrestling match of wills between you and them. Take a bath. Clean behind your ears. Go to bed. Do your homework. Read your Bible. <clears throat> Sounds like someone you know. Sounds like your daily routine. personal experience of anyone here today? Is there any hope for this child? Is there any hope for this individual? Are they ever going to make it? You try to encourage them to obey God and make choices, the right choices, but it never seems to register, and there is always a struggle there. Well, I'm sure each of us has a few of those individuals in our lives. Maybe in a few children that we may have or had. It may be you who others say that of. Well, today's life hero, hero of the faith, was just such a man. Jacob. His name means heel catcher in reference to his birth that he caught Esau by the heel. Before he even gives, he takes his first breath of air on this side, he's already struggling. It means heel catcher, trickster, or surplanter. He's later renamed by God and called Israel, which means he fights. 
or persist with God. Unfortunately, Jacob and later Israel really lived up to his name. The story of one of Jacob is one of continual struggle and striving. I just want to review the, the story of Jacob. If you want to turn your Bible to start in Genesis 25, I'm not going to read. I'm just going to recount the story, but I'll maybe mention some verses as we go along if you want to read them. But the story of Jacob starts in, in Genesis 25. He begins with struggle. As a twin in the womb with Esau, he jostled for position and was born grasping his brother's heel. When his mother, Rebekah, asked God during her pregnancy what was happening to her, God told her that there were two nations within her womb, and they would be divided. One would be stronger than the other, and the older would serve the younger, Genesis twenty five twenty three. Jacob and Esau grew up together, living a nomadic life. Esau became a fine hunter, and he loved to be outside and be out in the countryside, while Jacob was the exact opposite. He was quiet. He wanted to stay at home, be with his mom. Esau, being the hunter, was his father's favorite, as Esau, Isaac loved the wild game, while Jacob was favored by his mother, and we see that in Genesis 25, 28. This destructive favor, favoritism would follow the family into the next generation, most lo- notably with Jacob's son, Joseph. Such was Jacob's favoritism for Joseph that it caused great resentment among his brothers and nearly cost Joseph his life. As Dave read earlier, when Isaac was old, and his eyesight was faded, he realized he was near death, and he made arrangements with Esau to pass on to him the blessings that were due the firstborn son. We read that in Genesis 27, 1 through 4. On the hearing of this, Rebekah hatches a plan to deceive Isaac into blessing Jacob instead. Thus, Jacob received his father's blessing, and as Esau discovered, this was the second time he had been deceived by his brother. Esau vowed he would kill Jacob for this and soon as the period of mourning for his father was over in verse 41. Once again, Rebekah steps in and and warns Jacob of her brother's vow. And after influencing Isaac that Jacob should find himself a wife among his own people, Jacob is sent away off to his uncle Laban's house in Haran. During Jacob's journey, he has a dream of a ladder that is up, goes up to heaven with God at the top and angels ascending and descending. And God gives Jacob his assurance of his presence and the fulfillment of his promise to Abraham in Genesis 28, 13 through 15. As a result of this experience, Jacob renames the place Bethel, which means house of God. And he makes a vow at that point in his life in Genesis 28 to serve God. After Jacob settles in Haran, Laban offers him payment for the work he has been doing as a shepherd and looking after his flocks. As Jacob agrees with Laban to work for seven years in return for Laban's daughter, Rachel, whom he loved. However, Jacob was to discover that his uncle Laban could be just as much a deceiver as he had been. On Jacob's wedding night, Laban does the old switch, switching in his older daughter, Leah, for Rachel in Genesis 29, 23 through 25. However, Jacob agrees to, to, further, to work further for seven more years so that he can marry Rachel which he gives her in one week afterwards. And Jacob loves Rachel at the exclusion of Leah, and the family intrigue begins to spiral out of control. While Rachel remained barren, Leah gave birth to Jacob's first son, Reuben, then followed the birth of 11 more sons to Rachel, Leah, and two handmaidens. Eventually, Jacob receives God's command to return back to his land of his fathers, accompanied by his prophet, 
promise, and I will be with you, Genesis 31.3. So Jacob leaves Haran, taking with him his wife, his children, all the vast flocks that he accumulates. And when Laban learns that Jacob has left, he sets off in hot pursuit as he discovers his idols had been stolen. Great family, huh? <laughs> continuing, continuing the legacy of deception, Rachel had taken them, but she manages to conceal them from her father during the search. Laban and Jacob eventually part company after swearing an oath not to invade one another's lands or to do harm of its in inhabitants. His next highlight of his life comes when he has to face his brother Esau. Though 20 years had passed since they had last seen each other, the memory of Esau's threat to kill Jacob has never left him. In Genesis 32, 11. Jacob sends messengers ahead of him with gifts, instructing them to tell Esau that he was, he's following on. On this night, Jacob experiences the greatest highlight of his life when he wrestles with a man, which he finds out later to be God. In Genesis 32, 22 through 41. During this wrestling match, he is blessed by God and given the promised new name of Israel, the name that would remain with him and his descendants of the land of promise. And it remains this way until this day as well. And here's his name. To Jacob's relief, their reunion with Esau is a long one. Nevertheless, Jacob isn't finally trusting uh, is fully trusting uh, his brother. So instead of the meeting up with him as agreed, Jacob takes his family another route where they finally purchase a plot of land and settle in El Elohe, Israel, or mighty is the God of Israel. Jacob the deceiver is always weary of others who might try to deceive him. The following chapter, uh, Genesis 34, record the rape of Jacob's only daughter, Dinah, and the revenge of her brothers, Simeon and Levi, is carried out against the rapist in the entire community. A sad story in scripture. Once again, we see how the deceiver, uh, deviousness of the parents is passed to the children. Jacob uh, is livid with his sons, and in obedience to God's guidance, he moves his family back to Bethel in chapter 35. Genesis, where God reappears to Jacob and confirms his blessing in verses 9 through 10. In Jacob's meeting with God, he receives the promise that kings and many nations will come from him and that the land had promised that he had promised the forefathers would be his inheritance. Jacob's next experience is the death of Rachel, the one he loved, and the death of his father. chapter 35, 16 through 20. As the rest of the book of Genesis unfolds in the narr narrative concerning his sons, we see Jacob alone and despondent due to the unfaithfulness of his sons and the bereavement of the loss of his wife and his son Joseph. Trouble, trouble, and more trouble. That's the life. So how do we get from trickster, wrestling with God, fighting against God, to the statements that we read in Hebrews eleven twenty one by faith, Jacob, a man of faith? How do we get there? The concept of faith in the testimony of Jacob? Are you kidding me? How can God say that about him? I thought we were looking at great men of faith, Pastor. Jacob? Where does he fit in? The reading of his life story in Genesis is hard. It is hard to find a great man of faith. But you know what? God looks at things different than you and I do. Doesn't he? You know why? Because God looks at things like this. A lifetime. And when he looks at the lifetime of Jacob, he sees faith. We tend to look at our life and get discouraged, or we look at other people's lives and discouraged, or in our nation and other people that we're around, 
and we look at events, right, that discourage us. Where's your faith? How could you do that? That doesn't match up with this. We evaluate isolated incidents or even a string of selective events, and we make our judgments. But you know what? God doesn't look at faith. When he looks at Jacob, he says, he's a great man. And a great man. A hero. Allow God to prevail through your life's struggles. Allow him to. The life of faith involves many struggles, which is common to the life of believers and, frankly, to the unbelievers. But Jacob struggled with God in a different sense, didn't he? He struggled most of his life, as many as, as, as many people we, we know do, and maybe as you do. From birth to nearly the end of his life, we see struggle, struggle with man and struggle with God. Life inherently, since the fall, invo- involves toil and struggle. We are born to trouble as the sparks fly up. But we can hinder our faith by not responding properly to the struggles. Or, in the case of Jacob, we see, complicate them with improper faith choices. So what can we learn about faith from the life of Jacob? Number one, avoid the lack of faith choices that cause struggles and pain in your life. Avoid them. Veer away from them. There are Things, like I said, are inherent that we will all go through life in struggles. It, it just is. That's life on this side of the sun. But when other things come that are by our own choice and our own doing, avoid them because they will hinder your faith in him. Jacob's struggles in his faith were caused by three things. His continual playing of the deception game. Lying in deception with Isaac and Esau. His practice of deception caught up with him with Laban, causing him more additional toil and more work. 14 full years of it. You think you had to work for that bride next to you? (laughs) He worked 14 years to get the one he wanted. the story of Laban, we see the deceiver is deceived. A life of mistrust within his family causes him all kinds of headaches. He begets liars in ten of his sons, and they become grievous to his soul. But he had nowhere to look but himself, right? And their grandmother, who were deceivers. Here we see that the mind of those who plot to deceive is always suspicious in the motives of others and can never fully be at rest. His life of toil and struggle because of his deception. You know, people who are liars, perpetual liars, and before I got saved, I was a perpetual liar. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a never unresting life, is it? Because lying begets lying. You always have to cover up for the next one. And you know what it also produces? It produces lack of trust in those around you. You think everybody else is a liar, and you may be right. But you don't trust anybody. Jacob lived much of his life as a fugitive on the run. Secondly, his continual self-advancement and self-gain. If you look at the story of his life, there's this underlying, why did he do the deception? And it was always for what? He always wanted to promote himself. He always wanted to advance himself. He always wanted gain for himself. God's promises weren't enough for him. He had, I mean, he, he's a descendant of Abraham and Isaac. Don't you think he had enough for him? I mean, real. What kind of... He must have had tremendous wealth to start, but yet he throws it all away with his deception, and then he begins this life of advancement. I need to to gain. I need to gain. 
He was self-seeking and self-ambitious, always looking out for his own interests so as to get what he wanted in life. This is clearly seen in his constant struggle to get what he wants through deceit and manipulation of others. He supplants his brother in his drive to get his father's blessing and with Laban in bargaining and striving to get Rachel and to get his wealth. He even wrestles with God. If, you were, if we would have read the full story today, he wrestles for God for what reason? To secure a blessing in his life. What he did was not for others, but was always for his own gain. Genesis 29, 25 is what, and this, I'm not going to turn, you can, but in this little phrase, when he speaks to Laban, he makes this, and it, it's very indicative of his life. He says this to Laban, did not I serve with thee for Rachel? And you're saying, well, yeah, that was true, but it shows his heart, doesn't it? It shows in his heart that what he did was for his own interest. He wasn't for Laban's interest that he did the work. He did it for his own good. I just wanted to get ahead. The struggle to get ahead was a constant battle in his soul. This involved much heartache and pain for his family. And on several occasions, it may have cost him his life save for the promise, providence of God. The life of a self-seeking individual that, like Jacob, and if, and if you live like Jacob, it spilled over into his family, and it was seen in a strife between his wives and between his children. And if there's anything you can say about Jacob, is this little phrase, like father, like son, right? Eleven of the twelve were just like To work things out in your life? Do you? When you get into a mess, do you allow God to work it out? Or do you have a tendency to pursue and trust your own understanding and skill to work things out? Be honest with you. If, if you do... And in some sense, I understand that we should try to work through our issues and our problems with God's help. But, I mean, if you're relying on your own wits to do it, your own horse sense, your own skill, you're heading for a fall. And that's what Jacob did. As his life spirals out of control, he's always trying to work things and fix things. And it isn't to the time where he wrestles with God and God... And he lets, God lets him win. You know, he could have won. But he lets him win, lets him get his blessing, because that's what he always intended for. But in the process, Jacob learned something, finally. He learned something about God and about his constant toil and struggle. And we'll get to that very soon. His continual playing of the deception game, his continual self-advancement and self-glory, and thirdly, his lack of vision which faith brings to see God's working in his life. Through all the struggle and all the toil in, in his life, when we do that, we lose vision of God. Due to his, his constant fugitive lifestyle for much of his life, he fails to see God's hand, and he fails to see God's goodness upon his life, because if he would have stopped to look, he would have seen it. God was always fulfilling his promise to him, wasn't he? And even in his, in his sin and in his struggle, he's still reiterating to him, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless you. I will fulfill my promise. When he fails to see his goodness upon his life to protect him through each and every trial and to fulfill his promise to make him a great nation, struggling, wrestling, striving, in our own strength shall always, always cloud our vision in seeing his gracious hand and his fulfilling of his promises in us. 
what do we make of this? Point two, embrace that which helps you prevail against the struggles of life. And this is, to me, this is the key point. The faithfulness of our God, who remains constant even when we strive against him, despite the lack of faith at times, as at stretches or even the smallness of the faith in Jacob, God remains wonderfully faithful to him, doesn't he? That's what gets us through the struggles of life. If God was not faithful to us, where would we ever be? If we relied on our performance to win this life of faith, man, we would be in trouble. In fact, we'd be in constant trouble. Look around. People are in trouble all the time. And a lot of it's brought about by the consequences of their own poor choices in their life. But God is faithful. And be encouraged by that. Turn to Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. The Apostle Paul reminds us that life is not about our faithfulness necessarily, but by the faithfulness of God. Philippians 1, verse 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. The sanctification of your life ultimately is in God's hands and in God's faithfulness. And that's a good thing. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great, great thing, great truth. In the process of all the struggles, God works his plan. He fulfills his promises to this to Jacob despite his lack of faith. It is God's performance, not Jacob's, that counts. God can take the smallest and the weakest of faith and bring about wonderful results. And he did that for Jacob. God can take uh, all the events in our life and work it out for good if we but love him and surrender. He can work out his plan with the conflict with Esau though uh, through all the jealousy and the strife of his children to the famine and the deliverance of his family in Egypt through one of his sons, Joseph. God, in his providence, works out the promises. God is faithful to Jacob. In his faithfulness, in, it is his faithfulness that we will prevail over life's struggles. I don't know, dear child of God, the state of your life today. But if you have great struggles in turmoil, turmoil in your heart. You know, we can all come here and we, frankly, and it's not, it's not anything wrong, but we, we, the real you and the real heart struggles that we have, many may never see or know. But you know, God knows. Maybe your spouse doesn't even know the struggles that are in your heart and your life. If that's you here today, rest assured that God's still in full control of your life. Trust him. You know, the be still. Talked a little about this in Sunday school. We need to be still. You know, the winds and the waves still obey his word. He's still fully in control of this world in your life. It's based upon his faithfulness and not necessarily yours. So be still. Cease from the strife and rest in his arms in the joy in his faithfulness. Not just for this day, his faithfulness to you today, but throughout all eternity, he'll remain faithful to you. The faithfulness of our God is constant and complete. Secondly, and this was Jacob's point, humility and openness to God's molding through life struggles will produce rock solid faith. 
He's not much of a rock for the better part of a hundred some odd years of his life. But as we get to the end, we see a man of faith. It was a hard road, wasn't it? (laughs) As we'll look at. But you know, when I look at his life, I look at it as a sculpture. Well, I'm not a sculptor, okay? I would get done real quick. But someone who's a master sculptor, what do they do? They take this big block of rock. And they just begin to chip away at it. They have in their mind what they're going to make. So they just begin to chip away and chip away and chip away. And it takes time. And it takes patience. But you know, God takes us this big block of clay or stone and just begins to chip away at it. You know, and if we're humble to the master, that process is easier and and we're open to it, it it, it goes a lot smoother. But he wants to make a masterpiece of everyone's life here today. But it takes time to chip away. And we need to humble ourselves and allow God to do it. At glimpses of Jacob's life throughout his life, he passes through many mountains, many rocky passes, we see a glimpse of the magnificent magnificent faith, and in the end he dies in peace and humble worship of his God. As he progresses through this life, his faith increases. He learns how be it the hard way that he needs to depend upon God in his life and not in his own strength, and certainly not through manipulation of people to get what he wants. It was a hard road. Chips away, and chips away, and chips away. And he makes a masterpiece of the life of Jacob. Three events after the struggles in Haran, after we get through the bit with Laban, there's three significant events I feel in his life where he humbles himself. It leads to the statement that God makes of him leaning on his staff at the end of his life before he died, trusting in the promises that God would lead them back into the promised land. But three significant ones. So let's turn to Genesis 32 as we close with these three things. Genesis 32. Verses 9 through 12. This is when Jacob is fearful for his life and his family, and he prays a humble prayer to God, reminding him of his promise he had made to him to keep him safe uh, throughout his life. Genesis 32, 9 through 12. Starting with, it says this, And Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham, and God of my father Isaac, the Lord which says unto me, Return unto thy country, and to thy kindred, and I will deal with thee, deal well with thee. I am not worthy of the least of all thy mercies, and of all the, the truth which thou hast showed unto thy servant, for which my staff I passed over Jordan, and now I am become two bands. Deliver me, I pray thee, from the hand of my brother, and from the hand of Esau, and I, for I, I fear him, lest he will come and smite me, and the mother with the child and thou saidest i will surely do thee good and make thy seed as the sand of the sea which cannot be numbered for multitude so here this first one uh, he prays humbly prays to the lord right humble and open then the statement of god the prayer and subsequent final wrestling match on the eve of the meeting with esau against god leaves him with a limp it serves as a real turning point in his life, that humility that humbles him and, and builds his faith in God. You know, when you're in trouble, whether of your own doing or not, it is time to remind God of his promises. We don't necessarily pray that. We pray to get out of trouble, right? He doesn't pray that. He reminds God of his promises. We do well. 
in our time of trouble. Romans uh, 12, 4. So he does that, and he trusts, and he knows by faith that he who is faithful is going to fulfill it. Second situation, when Jacob has to deal with the supposed death of Joseph and his life. And remember, he's under the illusion there, delusion I should say, in his life that Joseph is dead. That's what he's been told. The deceiver has been told a lie. And in that process, it almost drove him to the point, I think it probably drove him to the point that he was ready to commit suicide. It was that bad. It drove him to such deep despair. But you know what? In that time of that struggle, he humbles himself. And he opens his heart and life to the Lord and trusts God by faith. It ends up with joy of knowing that the son Joseph was alive and that God through him would protect the nation and, and he and willingly leaves the promised land to dwell in the land of Goshen. But on the way, he worships and sacrifices to the Lord. Genesis 46, 1 through 7. Once again, he, he assures him of his promises to Jacob and the seed of the Abrahamic covenant. Third one, when Jacob is about ready to die. In his dying days, he makes Joseph vow that he will bury him in the promised land. Joseph would later do this to his son, Esau and Jacob, as we know. Now, the end of Genesis account describes his blessing to each of his sons and the nation in the land of promise. Remember, those blessings were given while he was in Egypt. Self is replaced with dependence. And this is the key as we endure struggles in our faith. The earlier we learn this principle, the better off we're going to be. If we humbly walk with God, it will lessen the struggles caused by self-ambition. And the normal struggles of life will be met with faith and dependence upon God that will grow our faith and change our perspective through the struggle. So the earlier we learn that, the better. Let the master knock some big chunks off the rock in the creation of his masterpiece. There is no great wisdom or bravery in Jacob to speak of. And we're tempted to see his life as more, uh, a little more than God's passive instrument as you read the pages of scripture. If we are tempted to think that, because we aren't in the spotlight performing great acts for God, we are unimportant to him, then we should consider the life of Jacob and know that in spite of our failings, God can and will still use us to fulfill his plan. Many of us, if not all of us, will not be great men of faith in man's eyes, but in our eyes, God's eyes, we just won't be. By just humbly opening our life to the Lord. You know, God looks at life cycles. Don't get bogged down with past failures, but learn from them. And by faith, turn to God and worship him and praise him for his faithfulness and being the God of your life. The one who covers our faults. Turn to him and worship him and, and remind him and of his promises to you and that he will keep them and be faithful and, and trust in you for that. If you're young, avoid, us old guys tell you, old guys to young guys, right? If you're young, avoid the pain and struggles and give, your, give unto God early in your life. It makes the road all the more smoother, doesn't it? You know, Experience isn't always the best teacher. A better way is to humble yourself, to avoid the pain and the agony and the struggles like Jacob did. Life has enough struggles in it, so avoid struggling against God and submit to his sweet will early in life and glory in his promises to you. The life of Jacob. If I quizzed you today, many of you, before I came in, you would have, if I would have said, Jacob, faith, you would have said, 
right? Be honest. God doesn't like it. You know why? Because he's holy. God is holy. It took a hundred and I think forty seven years to humble his people. But he did. And he fulfilled great promises that he made, of which we can praise him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this evening. We love you. And Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness in our life. Lord, I pray if there be one here today that struggles, struggles in life. Lord, we all do. But right now, uh, they seem like there's this weight upon them, this mountain of toil and trouble in their lives. May be caused by their own poor choices or the poor choices of those around them, but Lord, they have trouble. And more than they believe they can bear, they have it. If that's you and you would say, Pastor, pray for me, the life of struggle and striving around me and in me is overwhelming right now. And I need to, by faith, humble myself and open my heart and life to you, Lord. And trust him that he'll be faithful. If that's you, you're being clouded by the struggles of life. And you want the Lord to help you. If that's you, would you please raise your hand and say, Pastor, pray, pray for me. Pray for me. I need to trust the Lord and rely on his promises to me. If that's you, I need it. Just lift your hand. Struggles are too much to bear. Is there anyone here today that they would say, I don't know the Lord. I wrestle with them, but I wrestle with them on a different plane. I want my sin. I, I think I want my sin in the past, but today I want to turn from that today. And I want to rest completely in God. I'm going to let him win this wrestling match from now on. If that's you, would you raise your hand and say, Pastor, pray for me. I need to be saved. Is there anyone? No, no, no one. I need to be saved. Father, thank you for this time. Lord, I pray that you be glorified in this invitation. And Lord, as we go through this week, help us to be um, uh, models of faith in our individual choices by humbling ourselves to you. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Eric's going to come and lead us in the final hymn. We'll sing just one verse. Turn to hymn number 678, Trusting Jesus. Would you, play you can as we pray stand in your seat or come forward. We'll sing the first verse. Mm -hmm. 